Welcome to this video on the lineages from the tabletop role-playing game Promethean the Created. Prometheans are, as the name suggests, created rather than born. Despite the best efforts of the demiurges who create them, every Promethean awakens incomplete, imbalanced, and lacking a soul. So the created must go on a pilgrimage to transmute themselves from mere flesh to true humanity. Further hindering the Prometheans in their quest is their own unnatural natures, which disquiets nearly every mortal they meet, and can even go so far as to poison the world around them if they stay in one place for too long. But without further ado, the Promethean lineages. The Frankensteins. Is man greater than the sum of his parts? This is the question that drives the Frankensteins in pursuit of true life. Many are familiar with the story of Victor Frankenstein and his creature. Frankenstein sought to create a new atom through alchemy and science, but instead created a plague, a monster who, despite its aesthetic perfection, disgusted him. The creature walked the world trying to find humans who would accept it, only to find rejection at every turn. Humans knew he was different and unnatural. In time, the created came to hate the creator for giving him life and swore revenge. The creature tormented Frankenstein until he agreed to create an Eve for his failed Adam, a bride. But the bride was also a failure. Either she was never given life, destroyed by the doctor before he made another such mistake, or she was given life and rejected the creature she had been created as a companion for. Eventually, the creature hounded Frankenstein to his death in the Arctic. For all of their strength and emotions, Frankensteins are incomplete. They may possess all of the parts of a human, taken from the pieces of the dead and reanimated by lightning, but they are not human, not yet. Indeed, Frankenstein's monster, the first of its kind, is regarded as a mistake not only by its creator, but by other Prometheans. Even when they are beautiful, they are still unnatural, inhuman, and that is a fact that the Frankensteins know at their very core, one that separates them from all others. In time, the separation may take them from mere inhumanity to monstrosity. Others seek to prove their humanity through their valor, becoming secret saviors to those who would otherwise despise them. Every Frankenstein is made of bile and fire. The bile comes from the assembly of corpse limbs and organs sewn together into an amalgam of a complete human. The fire is the fire of heaven, lightning, which pulses through them as they awaken to new life. They feel the fire in them, a fire that belies their lack of a soul, which makes them honest, even those who are otherwise disturbed by them find the Frankensteins persuasive, and they know what they are. They knew it from the moment they awakened, and if they cannot lie to themselves, what is the point in lying to others? When a Frankenstein is made from inharmonious parts, they can seem even more alien. Torment only makes this condition worse for them. The hand of a murderer still contains a piece of that person, so a Frankenstein may be driven against their will to do some awful deed. Frankensteins learn their languages from half-remembered memories of the corpses who comprise its new body and the words it hears so often after awakening. This makes them unpolished and gruff, even when they are otherwise as intelligent as those they speak to. Fire and bile drive a Frankenstein towards mortality. Bile makes them discontent with their incomplete state, a disgust with what they are, and a need to escape to something else. Fire in the form of lightning drives them to fight for what they want even if it is not a physical fight. They struggle and claw their way to mortality for the acceptance of other Prometheans and against the emotions that seem to well up in them unbidden. The Frankensteins are the quickest of all Prometheans to anger. When they are not accepted as human, their frustration manifests as rage and usually people die as a result. The desire to become mortal can quickly turn into an envy of those who already are and an anger at the seeming lack of appreciation for what those mortals have. When a Frankenstein's plans are thwarted, their most common response is violence. Galatea. Beauty is only skin deep, yet still, humans desire to possess it. The first of this lineage was Galatea, the creation of the sculptor Pygmalion. Pygmalion, who truly did not love these hoes, nor did he seek to turn a hoe into a housewife, secluded himself in his work embracing the Sigma male lifestyle. But his desire for companionship remained, and in a fury of divine inspiration, he created his ideal woman in ivory. 
he fell in love with his creation, turning it into his waifu. Eventually, he prayed to the goddess Aphrodite that she give him a wife like his creation. The goddess Aphrodite, who was born of chaos, responded by making the statue into a real woman, Galatea. Pygmalion and Galatea were married, and the statue-turned-woman gave birth to Paphos, the founder of the city of the same name in Cyprus. The Galateans tell the story a little differently, however. Pygmalion the sculptor, rather than creating his bride from stone, took the most beautiful woman in Cyprus and used a ritual to infuse the corpse with the divine breath, creating the first Galatea. The two then repeated the ritual on their adopted child, Paphos, creating both the city and the Promethean lineage. Whether born of stone or flesh, all Galateans are beautiful, but it is a beauty that makes them both noticeable and discomforting. The Azoth lurks just beneath their skin, causing awe and uncertainty. They both attract and repel. They were created to both love and be loved in return, yet they cannot communicate their desires to the humans who desire them and they desire in turn. Yet despite their frustrations, they remain optimistic. After all, their progenitor was transmuted, so hope remains for them, even when they are reckless and passionate. As they were originally created by the power of Aphrodite, they possess a sliver of her chaos, and when taken by chaos, they will gladly humiliate and abase themselves just to get nearer to mortals, and even if it destroys the relationships that were created prior to. The aphorism of muses is also well earned. Galateids have inspired works of art throughout history, from their former patron Aphrodite to the Virgin Mary. Some even wonder whether Aphrodite created Galatea, or if Galatea is the inspiration for the goddess Aphrodite. Inspiration is at the heart of a Galatea's being, given their nickname of Muses. Several artists have been driven to the heights of their creative abilities, or to madness, by the disquiet of the Galateans. The creation of a Galatean is born of death and beauty, as the corpse used to create them must be exquisite and unmarred by death. The body is then soaked in a bath of wine vinegar, herbs, and a solution of pearls and lime sand. Then the Galatean's creator, their muse, awakens them with a kiss, infusing them with the divine fire, Azoth. But the Galateans are too beautiful and too perfect. Put another way, Galateans, especially when they channel their pyros, their divine fire, the more their beauty falls into the uncanny valley territory, and many Galateans learn firsthand how closely linked love and hate can be. Osiris The story of Osiris is one of the oldest in the world. Osiris the Pharaoh was betrayed, hacked to pieces, and scattered across the land by his brother and usurper, Set. But Osiris's wife and sister, Isis, was a magician and she journeyed across Egypt gathering all of the parts of Osiris except one, the part that differentiates the plugs from the outlets. Isis removed his organs, bandaged and embalmed him. At some point in this process, Isis added a replacement for his original factory standard equipment which he and his sister wife used to create their son, Horus, who would go on to expel Set from the kingdom. Osiris transcended his state of resurrection to become a god of the Egyptian dead and the ruler of Sektet Aru, the afterlife. The Prometheans tell a slightly different version of the story. According to the created, she knew that when Osiris rose again, he would not be the man he was. His powers of speech and reason would remain, but his memories died with him. Through her resurrected husband, or rather his remains, Isis would rule Egypt. And so it was until Isis and Osiris created a son for themselves. Given that the created cannot reproduce, and Osiris lacked the necessary piston and crankshaft to fill that cylinder, they made another Promethean, Horus. But Horus was created with a purpose, to battle Set and destroy him. Some believe that Horus was the true progenitor of the Osiran lineage. Others claim that he was a Pandoran, a monster, a hawk-headed beast of prey pointed at his serpentine uncle. Regardless, Horus succeeded in his task, but he did not just slay Set, he also slew Isis, his mother, or creator, or both. As to why, perhaps he wanted to free Osiris from her influence. Perhaps he was a Pandoran and beyond all reason, simply looking for more foes to slay. To this day, the Osirans are unsure as to their true progenitor, and most do not dwell on it over much. As their name implies, the Osirans carry themselves regally. After all, they are the descendants of a king and a god. 
When they command, they expect to be obeyed. And if obedience is not forthcoming, well, is it not the privilege and duty of the noble to punish those who besmirch their honor? The creation of a new Osirin follows in the footsteps of the Osiris legend. A body is submerged in river water, then cut into pieces with a bronze knife. One piece is taken away, the smallest, and destroyed. Usually it is something small, like a finger, a toe, or an ear. More spiteful creators might take a hand, an eye, or even a nose. But when tradition is at issue, it's usually the old twig and berries that get the knife. Finally, the creator imbues roses with azoth, crushes the petals, and stuffs them into the corpse's mouth. As the new Osiren awakens, they chew and swallow, filling the Promethean with both divine fire and life. But crossing and recrossing the river of death leaves something of their emotions on the other side. This makes the Osirens frightening for both the precision of their deductive reasoning and the coldness of their decision making. The Tammuz Of all the Promethean lineages, the Tammuz have the one that is probably the most opaque. The most common version links the Tammuz to the 15th century creation of the Golem of Prague by the rabbi Lo Bilali. Bilali gave life to his creation by implanting a scroll with one of the names of God beneath the clay man's tongue, then etched the word for truth on its brow. Each night he would change one letter of the word, changing it from Emet, truth, to Met, death. And so each night the golem died, and each morning it was reborn. But one night the rabbi forgot to send his golem into its death sleep. That was the same night the creature became self-aware. It rampaged through the streets of Prague, leaving death and chaos in its wake. The rabbi eventually found the golem and managed to pry the scroll from its mouth. He then buried the scroll beneath the synagogue. But the Tammuz know that the rabbi Lo was not the inventor of the Shem, nor was he the first to create a golem. Some claim that the Demiurge who gave birth to their lineage was none other than the prophet Daniel, who wanted to create a tireless, deathless servant to protect his people during their exile in Babylon. Others believe his motives, along with his morals, were more suspect. Daniel supposedly created his servant bound in a dreamlike state. The Tammuz believe that this spell of mindlessness is what Lo used when the Golem of Prague went wild. As to what the spell entails, and if it affects any Tammuz, or only those fall into torment. Ever since the Golem of Prague, the spell has never been used on a Tammuz. The story, however, has a third layer to it. There are Tammuz who attribute the creation of their lineage to Ishtar, the Babylonian goddess, in truth a sorceress, who used her magic to return her lover, or possibly servant, or both, from death. Most Tammuz believe that their progenitor and namesake was Ishtar's slave for a time, until she set him free, or he escaped, or he killed her and left her corpse on a hook before destroying Babylon and beginning his pilgrimage. Some Osirans suspect that they and the Tammuz share a demiurge in common, given that Isis and Ishtar are very similar, usually preceding some claim to rule their inferior clay relations. For their part, the Tammuz dismiss the Osirans out of hand. Regardless of where the golems came from, whether they were created by priests, sorcerers, or goddesses, every one of them has the same desire, freedom. The Tammuz earnestly believe that everyone who has a soul is free, regardless of their material conditions, because their soul means that they will continue on beyond death of crude flesh. The soulless have no hope of life after death, or reincarnation, or rejoining the great spirit, or whatever the fate of the soul is. It is why those with souls fear them. They are truly unnatural, as evidenced by the aura of disquiet that they and all other Prometheans exude. Having been created as slaves, the Tammuz are the most reluctant of the created to create even more of their kind. But when they do, they take the body to a suitably dark place in the earth, inscribe a word of power imbued with Azoth, and place it under the corpse's tongue. Then the body is marked with some old identifier of slavery, a shaved head, tattoos, or a gold or iron ring through the ear or nose. Then the corpse is buried deep in the earth. When it has absorbed enough of the earth's strength, the newborn Tammuz can dig itself out of the ground and begin its journey towards mortality and freedom. The Ulgan According to the Mongol and Turkic people, Ulgan was a creator god who crafted all of the heavens and the earth. One of his creations was Erlik, 
a piece of earth with the face of a man. For a time, Ehrlich and Ulgan were friends, but Ehrlich was a proud and wrathful spirit. When Ulgan and Ehrlich finally fought, Ulgan banished Ehrlich to the underworld, making him the first of the Karakam, the Black Shamans. The Karakam who followed after Ehrlich learned from him how to cross between the world and the spirit world. The price they paid for his teaching was that they entered his dark realm, where he tore them to pieces and put them back together, before returning them to the material world. The version of this story that leads to the created is a shaman calling himself Tengri, who sought to create a spirit-riven slave. For his experiment, he used a man of his village named Ulgan, who possessed a strong spirit. Tengri sent Ulgan into the twilight, where the demons of that place tore him to pieces while he was still alive and conscious. Tengri then plucked him from the twilight and remade him. Ulgan had lost his soul to Tengri's work, but not his memory, and his first act after awakening was to kill Tengri. Ulgan then did to Tengri what had been done to him. When Tengri awakened, his powers remained, but his personality stayed in the twilight. Ulgan named the remade Tengri Ehrlich, making them the first of their lineage. There are some Ulgans who prefer to call themselves Orpheans, who take their origin from the legendary demigod Orpheus, who descended into the underworld to retrieve his lover, Eurydice. When Orpheus returned from his doomed quest, the priestesses of Dionysus ripped his body apart and threw him into a river. But Dionysus, the god, or demiurge in this case, who restored the shattered but still living demigod to a semblance of life. Whether Mongol or Greek, Orphean or Ulgan, the created of this lineage are torn apart and remade, both in body and spirit. Every Ulgan exists without a cut or a soul. In the place of their souls is ectoplasm, or ether, the substance of the spirit world. To be Ulgan is to be a walking contradiction. They who are without souls must deal with the spirits, as they carry a piece of the twilight within them. Every one of the Ulgan is a shaman because they must be. To be a shaman means to be a diplomat to the spirits. They know the rituals and forms that must be observed. In an unusual irony, the spirits lack any human context. One of the few pleasures of Ulgan existence is to ridicule powerful spirits without their ever being aware that they are being mocked. The Ulgan likewise enjoy mocking their own allies, typically subtly and without malice. Unlike other Prometheans who are driven by their more elemental humors, the Ulgan is driven by a thing that is fundamentally immaterial. They see what others cannot or refuse to see. The Ulgan quest for mortality is a perilous one. For them to become mortal does not dissipate their ectoplasm or purely convert it. Rather, simply gaining a soul, a redeemed ribbon, pulls the material and spirit worlds closer together. More troubling is that the descendants of an Ulgan who has gained mortality inherit the spirit substance in their blood, making them prime candidates to be turned into Ulgan themselves. And for some Prometheans, that is enough. To create more of their kind requires one close to the spirit realm. Most Ulgan are content to find a corpse that meets their needs. The impatient, or immoral, simply make the necessary corpse. Then they spew ectoplasm all over the body. As the substance dissolves back into the twilight, it takes the unfortunate corpse with it. The Ulgan summon spirits, with their own screams, or those of a dying horse or golden-haired dog, sacrificed for the task. The spirits then appear, tear the body to pieces, and leave it for the Ulgan to do their work. When the pieces are reassembled, the creator breathes more ectoplasm onto it, imbued with Azoth, creating another Ulgan. Each new Ulgan is a new shaman, and each new Ulgan shaman is an opportunity to inch the immaterial and material closer together with mortality. What happens when they are close enough for the spirits to break through? Well, you better hope the Arathar are nearby. The Unfleshed Depending upon where one stands, the Unfleshed are not an actual lineage of Prometheans, but something else, as each is essentially a progenitor. As their name suggests, they are not born of corpses but of sturdier stuff, usually metal, steel, and plastic, with the goal of emulating or even improving human biology. Few Unfleshed are created purposely, and the same is true of the involvement of a demiurge in the process. But the divine fire has a will, and uses those it will to see its goals carried out. 
Some of these creators have been quite surprised when their machines seem to act of their own volition. Every creator of an unfleshed, demiurge or not, becomes obsessed with using mechanics and science to duplicate in metal what is done by flesh and bone. When the vessel is finished, whether that process takes days, weeks, or years, the creator's role is likewise finished. The divine fire leaves him and passes into the object of his passion and drive. The creator is stripped of the divine fire, even if they do not realize it, and what lies before them is their magnum opus, the pinnacle of their creative powers and intellect, never again to be duplicated. This drives some creators to despair, to madness, and even to suicide. Even creators who care for their unfleshed creations are driven away by disquiet in time. The unfleshed awaken differently. For some, it is a sudden bursting into their imitation of life. For others, the divine fire works on them more gradually, in processes and conclusions that fall outside of their programming, conclusions that might be mistaken for leaps of logic, or even instincts. But slow or fast, awareness leads the unfleshed to the conclusion that they are incomplete. The divine fire gives them life, but not a soul. So they set out to complete themselves and conclude the great work that is themselves. Some unfleshed, having had only their creator as a link to humanity, find it possible, and in some cases preferable, to avoid the drive to become human. Whether it is from resentment of humans, fear of them, or fascination with their own present form, some of the mechanical created refuse to begin the great work. As stated before, some do not consider the unfleshed to be a lineage because procreation is difficult for them, so much so that few born of machine create more of their kind. They lack any inherent understanding of humanity that came from the past lives of their own creators and are rarely tied closely to humanity in their own right. Essentially, one unfleshed progenitor creating another is a case of the blind leading the blind when it comes to the pilgrimage and seeking a soul of their very own. The Zeki. The Zeki are abhorrent, even by the standards of the Prometheans. They are born from, and polluted by, nuclear hellfire. Where other created have a single progenitor, the Zeki have five. In 1945, a scientist working on the Manhattan Project cracked. On July 16th, he and three other scientists snuck a corpse near the test site of the Trinity bomb. When they returned to the site, the body vanished. The corpse rose from the concrete slab and buried itself until its demiurge gave it up for lost. Less than a month later, the second Zeka was resurrected in the ruins of Hiroshima. An elderly man, driven by grief and dreams of restoring his dead wife, prepared her body for what he knew was coming on August 6th. The firestorm that burned the man to ash turned into Azoth inside of his wife's body. She rose, surrounded by death and ruin and wandered between Hiroshima and Nagasaki as the Hibakusha, a bomb-affected person. Nine years later, the third Zeka was created on Bikini Atoll by a German scientist who escaped prosecution so that he could work on Operation Castle for the United States. The mad physicist never gave up on the dream of the Reich to create an Ubermensch, but rather than create the Overman with breeding, he would create him with nuclear power. To his credit, the scientist remained by his creation side, making corrections and adjustments to the process right until the bomb went off. The Zeka awakened, wandered the island for a few days, and then walked into the sea, never to be seen or heard from again. In 1956, a British scientist created another Zeka in Maralinga, Australia, during Operation Buffalo. This fourth Zeka lasted a year before destroying itself by sitting at the site of another atomic bomb test known as Operation Antler. The fifth and final Zeka progenitor was created in 1958 by the Russian scientist Dr. Mikhail Alexandrovich Elizarov, who was assigned to examine the prisoners of the Novaya Zemla Gulag and the effects of the radioactive mine on their bodies. Dr. Elizarov had acquired a copy of Dr. Victor Frankenstein's notes and used them to develop his own theories on how to create a Promethean. Instead of electricity, he would use nuclear fire. His material would be the Zeki, the prisoners who died of radiation poisoning, and gave the lineage its name. Elizarov's experiment was a success. His creature remained with the doctor and submitted to his tests and questions while learning of its surroundings. But when the Soviet authorities realized what Elizarov had done, 
they sent the secret police to arrest him and destroy his creature. The creature responded by destroying them all with a radioactive blast that caused them all to die of rapid terminal cancer within weeks. The creature then wandered Novaya Zemla for three years, until October 3, 1968, the day the Soviets tested the 50 megaton thermonuclear weapon, Tsar Bomba, the most powerful man-made explosion in human history. The creature, finally inspired to leave the island, took with it the name of that weapon and made it its own. The existence of the Zeki is one of suffering. It is not the suffering of the lack of a soul or separation from humanity, but actual physical pain. This may be why at least one of the progenitors of the lineage destroyed itself rather than continue existing. The pain is not enough to cripple or disable them, but it is constant and cannot be relieved, which only contributes to their torment. With the restrictions on nuclear testing, new Zeka are created from the corpses of those who died of radiation poisoning. The method of awakening the new nuclear Prometheans varies. One was created by causing a reactor to go critical and then was carried inside. Another was buried in the soil of Chernobyl and then dug up. A third was awakened when Azeka tapped the plutonium inside of the corpse's skull with another loose piece of plutonium. But like all Prometheans, the Zeki cause disquiet wherever they go. But unlike their fellow created, Azeka's disquiet can turn fatal for those around it as it increases in the form of radioactivity. The Extempore Many Prometheans have an advantage over humans. They know who created them and why. That question of why I am here, which so beleaguers the human mind, but not so with the extempores. Regardless of lineage, the one thing that unites the Prometheans is that they are the product of alchemy, whether or not their creators are completely aware of that fact. Regardless of the forms and rituals and symbols used in their creation, Every one of the created is the product of a precise, generative formula which they use in turn to create lineages. But does a will need to be involved if all of the components are arranged in the proper place by chance? Chance is what the extempore are. Accidental creations, one in a million chances that resulted in life springing from death. Every extempore is the result of a unique set of circumstances that likely can never be reproduced. There are some Promethean scholars who speculate that the extempores are the products of divine intervention by beings believed to be arch kashmal, creatures composed entirely of the divine fire, pyros, but no proof has ever been found that the arch kashmal even exists. The extempores who do exist were the results of natural disasters, fires, floods, earthquakes, avalanches, tornadoes, hurricanes, and the like. And while the extempores may have similarities to one another, or even existing lineages, each extempore is serendipitous, the first and last of their kind, a lineage of one. And those were the lineages of Promethean. Promethean is not a game that was in my wheelhouse, which is why it took me so long to put out anything for the game. It's certainly a concept that should be familiar to World of Darkness players, the idea of redemption, completion, restoring humanity, what have you. What's different is that the Prometheans really can't blend in with humanity, thanks to the otherworldly pyros that animates and dooms them to wander the earth until they gain a soul. The use of alchemical humors in their bodies is also a nice little change-up. Anyway, that's all I have for now. Until next time.